Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. Today on the bench we're going to look at designing what's known as a common emitter amplifier. And we're going to use voltage divider bias. Of course this is going to be a class A circuit. It's a small signal type amplifier used to where you want to bring a small voltage up to a higher level. For example a smaller voltage up to like line level which you would feed into a power amplifier or you know whatever need you have to amplify a small signal. Now this video is not for college students who are out looking for equations that might be used on your next exam. This is meant for the hobbyists that need something simple to build an amplifier. You know, I'm going to simplify this and make it practical I'm not going to get deep into the equations. So we have the amplifier circuit here. We have the voltage divider, which is made up of this resistor and this one here, RB1 and RB2. RE is known as an emitter degeneration resistor because it mitigates some of the nonlinearities of the transistor. And also it works with our bias circuit. Before I actually start designing this circuit, let's take a look at some of those nonlinearities. I'm not going to get into an in-depth discussion of how transistors work, how we should model them. If you're into that, you might want to look into the ebers mole transistor model. But just be aware that there are nonlinearities in a transistor circuit that we must mitigate if we're going to have a decent performing amplifier. So yeah, I call this the naked transistor because if you cover up the emitter degeneration resistor here, we're left with a transistor that has physical properties that cause nonlinearities. Before I get into that, let's take a look at what's going on with the currents in the transistor and how we can simplify that down. Well, we put in a base current and if we multiply that by what's known as the beta, the current gain of the transistor, that'll give us the collector current. When the base current goes into the transistor, it has to come out somewhere, and it comes out the emitter. That's also true for the collector current. That current comes in, the transistor is going to have to exit somewhere, and that will be the emitter as well. So the emitter current is simply the base current plus the collector current. Well these small signal transistors we're talking about today will usually have pretty high gains, pretty high betas. That could range from 100 up beyond 400. So if we use an example here and say that our transistor has a gain of 100, we put 10 microamps into the base here, our collector will be 10 microamps times 100 giving us a collector current of 1 milliamp. Now since both currents converge and come out of the emitter junction, the emitter current will be 1.01 .01 milliamps. Now here's where we can simplify this. That base current is so small, we can, for all intents and purposes, just ignore it and say that collector current and emitter current are the same. So in our example, it would just be 1 milliamp. So now let's talk about some properties of the transistor that cause some nonlinearities. And I'm going to be very brief on these. I was thinking about saying more, but the video just stretches out and stretches out. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be brief. Now there's something called an intrinsic emitter resistance that you can think of that's in series with the emitter inside the transistor. And due to the properties of the transistor, it happens to be around 26 ohms per milliamp. And it's inversely proportional to the current. So the higher the current, the lower this resistance value becomes. So at 2 milliamps, it becomes 13 ohms. So it's, in other words, it's 26 ohms divided by 2 milliamps. And conversely, at a lower current, we'll say half a milliamp, it's 26 divided by 0.5, which is 52. So herein lies the problem. If we put a signal into this transistor, 
the current through this transistor is going to vary with the signal. That means the value of this resistor is going to change. This is a nonlinearity which causes distortion. As a matter of fact, with transistors that do not have the emitter degeneration resistor, you'll have great amounts of second harmonic distortion. Another nonlinearity is called the early effect. Now, if you recall, when we put a current into the base of the transistor, multiply that by the beta, or the gain, we get the collector current. So by definition, the transistor is acting as a constant current source, or a current sink, depending on how you look at it. So again, by definition, as we change the voltage on this collector, the current through the transistor should not change. However, it does, and again, that's due to the physical nature of the transistor. The current increases as the collector voltage increases. In fact, we can model it as a resistor tied across the collector emitter junction. And if you ever looked at curve traces of a transistor, where we have different base currents, then we look at the collector emitter voltage versus the collector current. Ideally, we want these lines to be nice and flat horizontally, but they have a slight slope to them, and that's due to the early effect. And the value of that resistor would depend on how much of a slope we have here. And as the collector current increases, so does the slope. Now, the early effect in a small signal amplifier is not as menacing as the distortion caused from the intrinsic emitter resistance, but just know that it's there and can be an issue. Last but not least, transistor gain varies from one piece to another. You know, you can test a bunch of transistors and the gain will be all different. That makes it kind of hard to set your quiescent points when you're designing your circuit. And they're thermally sensitive as they warm up the gain changes. If you want to really go down the rabbit hole, look at the ebers mall model of the transistor. Okay, so now let's clothe our naked transistor. Let's put the parts on it that make it behave the way we want, reduce the nonlinearities, and make a decent amplifier. Well, I like to start with figuring out RC, the collector resistor. And this is where you need to know the impedance of the circuit you're connecting to. Well, let's say this is a little preamplifier and we're going to connect it to a power amplifier. It has an input impedance of 22 kilo ohms. Well, if I made this resistor 22 kilo ohms, that would be the same value, so the signal's voltage would be cut in half of what the circuit would put out with no load. Well, that might be unacceptable, so you want to reduce this value and it depends on what you want. You want something acceptable. One-tenth the value might be good, but you also have to think about the current. You know, the lower the value of this resistor, the higher the current, and we'll see why in a moment. So for my example, I'm going to make it a 4.7K resistor. That will be quite low enough that we're not going to cause such a large voltage loss. So now I need to know how much current is going to flow through this resistor. And that's quite easily done. Well, in my example, I'm using a 12 volt supply. And the voltage at the collector will be around six volts, give or take. It may not be perfect, but it needs to be around that. And that is half the supply voltage. The reason for that is to give the proper headroom for your waveform. Now, if you bias this too high, you're gonna clip the top of your waveform off Conversely, if it's biased at too low a voltage, you'll clip the bottom of your waveforms. You won't have enough headroom for the swing of the voltage. So yeah, we bias it about half the supply voltage. So half the supply voltage, 12 volts divided by 2, is 6 volts. Now we know our collector current. So with a little bit of Ohm's Law, we know that the current is... 1.27 milliamps, and I just rounded it to 1.3. So, you know, 6 volts divided by 4.7K is 
1.3 milliamps. And again, that's what's flowing in our emitter circuit as well. Next, we want to figure out the gain of the circuit. Is it just so happens that the gain will be the ratio of these two resistors, RC divided by RE? And I would like a gain of about 10. Let's say we put 100 millivolts in here. I want to get 1 volt out. So we need a gain of 10. Well, that's quite easy because 1 tenth of this is 470. Okay, now we need to design our voltage divider bias circuit. What values would this be? And how do we figure up what voltage to select? And we have to select different values here so we get a certain voltage here. How do we do all that? Well, generally you want much more current flowing in your voltage divider circuit than is flowing in the base circuit. How much is flowing in the base circuit? Well, we know we have 1.3 milliamps here, and we have a beta of 100. So we have 13 microamps of base current. So we want a higher amount, maybe 10 or 20 times larger. You can go even higher, but the problem is the higher the value means you need lower value resistors. And that means the input impedance will be low. So I'll just say... 20 times the current, 13 microamps times 20, is 260 microamps. And now that we know that, we can calculate what the sum of these two resistors are going to be. Ohm's Law to the rescue again. We have 12 volts divided by 260 microamps. That gives us a total resistance value of 46 point something kilo ohms. Okay, so we have 46 kilo ohms, but now we need to break it into two resistors. I need to know what voltage to put on this base here. In other words, this voltage divider circuit needs to have the resistance values chosen to set the proper voltage here. Well, that voltage is going to be the voltage drop across RE plus the diode junction drop on the base to emitter junction, which is like 0.65 volts. So let's calculate this and add it to this, and that'll be our voltage. 470 ohms times 1.3 milliamps is 0.61 volts, plus 0.65 volts gives us 1.26 volts, and that's what we need to set the voltage on the base too. Once again, Ohm's law, we can calculate what this resistance is because we know this voltage and we know the current going through the resistor. Okay, so I Ohm lawed all of these values out. This came up to like 4.8K. Well, the closest value you can get is 4.7. And this came up as that original total value we had, 46K minus this, and the closest is 39K. I think it came up like 41 or something like that. Well, yeah, the closest I can get is 39K as a common value. Okay, so now we have all of the resistors calculated. We just need to know about these capacitors. And in interest to keeping the video shorter, I'm not going to get into that. It's just your high-pass filter equation. Keep in mind that both of these resistors will appear in parallel to the input signal. And we can ignore the base impedance because it's going to be much higher than these. In fact, the value of this resistor is what dominates what that would be. And for the output, I would base it on the output impedance of the amplifier. Or if you know you're going to be driving a higher impedance load, you can base your calculations on that. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so now that we have this done, let's hook it up and take some measurements. Okay, here is the circuit. Ignore this stuff up here. That's from another video. 
but yeah this is our little transistor amplifier and I had to measure the transistor because it's unmarked it's one of those Radio Shack specials where they come in a bag of like 25 they don't have any marking on them I think they're supposed to be 2N2222 A's or something like that so I put it in the component test thingy there and uh, it's an NPN with a small signal gain of 171 which is essentially beta and the voltage base to emitter is 0.7 I used 0.65 so it's a little different, so we might get slightly skewed results here. Plus the fact that I had to adjust my resistance values to the closest available value. But let's see how this thing performs. Let's see if I can get that in the shot a little better. It'll have to be sideways, unfortunately. Just don't have the room here. So let's check our supply voltage first. Make sure I got that set. 11 point, yeah, that's close enough to 12. Let's measure the collector voltage. It's hard to do it with a camera in my face here. Look at that. Very close to the 6 volts we wanted. That's very good. I'm kind of curious of the base voltage. That is 1.8. Two, three. What did we uh, what did we calculate there? One point two six. I'd say we did pretty good there. And we know that the currents are going to be pretty similar because of the voltages we measured due to the resistances used. Okay, so now let's put a signal into the thing and see what it does. Okay, I have all the probing installed. And putting a signal from, say it with me, the Field Tech. This quality piece of electronic lab equipment. So let me get you pointed at the scope here. Okay, let's take a look at the waveform. We have a nice looking sine wave. I'm not going to look at the distortion. I did that in the last video. Without the emitter degeneration, we had like 8% of a second harmonic. And that diminished to like 0.3 or something like that percent. Now let me get some waveforms on the screen. This is the input signal set to one about 100 millivolts. So let's look at the output signal. And I should mention that this is an inverting amplifier. That's why it's 100 degree, 180 degrees out of phase. So if I tweakulate the signal, so we have about 100 millivolts in. We have, it's hard for me to see that purple, 971 out, a little less than a gain of 10. And like I said, that's because uh, some of the values we had to adjust. But the amplifier works, does what it's supposed to. And that's how we designed the amplifier. We didn't resort to the more sophisticated equations. I mean, you could if you want, but, you know, this gets the job done. Well, I'm sure the video is getting long, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you for your viewership, support, and we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching.